John's role is to remind us that God brings us a total transformation, not only of our lives and our hearts, but our world as well. Our second scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 67 through 80. We're going to be reading uh, in the New Testament here for Luke chapter 1, and you can follow along either in your bulletin where it's printed for your convenience or in your own Bible or in the Bible in the pew rack in front of you. This is from Zechariah and his prophecy based on what he has seen and heard over the past nine months or so of his life. So I invite you to hear these words from Luke's gospel. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed him. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we being rescued from the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. The word of God for us, the people of God. You know, technically, I should have sung most of that passage to you, but I am sure you're glad that I did not do that this morning. Now, why would I technically have to sing that passage? Because... We believe that Zechariah did not just, at that moment, freed to be able to speak for the first time in many months. We don't think that he just said, blessed be the God of Israel. We believe that he burst out in song. Why? Many of the psalms that we read are not just poems in the Old Testament. They are worship songs. The psalms are meant to be sung. Now, do we know the tune that goes with most of them? No. But they would have been sung in some way as a song of praise. That is exactly what Zechariah is doing in here. He is singing a song of praise. How does he come up with the words? Well, the hint there is that he is filled with the Holy Spirit, that God is working with Zechariah to find the words to celebrate this important moment. Now, Zechariah, I mentioned, was not able to speak for about nine months. You may remember his story, and if you don't, you can go back to the very beginning of the book of Luke, chapter 1, and see what happens to him. Basically, what happens to Zechariah is that he's a priest, and it was his time to serve in the sanctuary of God. He goes in alone, because you had to go in alone. He had to be uh, ritually clean. He had to prepare himself. He had to pray he had to dip himself in the water. He had to ritually clean himself to be in the presence of God because you couldn't just walk in into the presence of God. Bad things would happen. So he cleansed himself. He got ready. He went into the temple to give incense, to burn incense as an act of worship to God. And as soon as he entered into the sanctuary, he saw an angel standing before him, who we find out later is the angel Gabriel. And it was Gabriel who told Zechariah that he and his wife, Elizabeth, would have a child, even though they were well past childbearing years. They would have a child, and that that child would prepare the way for the person that God was sending next, a Messiah. 
and that they should name that child John. Now, Zechariah was a little bit hesitant to believe Gabriel. How can this be? That was his question. I mean, he thought about his wife. He thought about himself. They were much older than the age that people normally had children. How could this be? And because he was reluctant, doubtful, hesitant, Gabriel told him, you will not speak again until you have seen what I have told you today. And so for nine months, or maybe a little bit more, until the day that he breaks out into a song of praise, Zechariah did not utter another word. Now I know what's going to happen to some people in this sanctuary after they go home today. Somebody, probably a wife, is going to pray, Dear God, please strike my husband mute for the next nine months. I don't know if, if Julie felt that way, uh, but um, about, let's say, 12 years ago, my daughter, Lena, was about to be born. We were in the hospital, and, and really, husbands don't have a lot of work to do in the hospital other than to be a good coach, and we don't really do that very well. But one of the things I was supposed to do was to count during the contractions. So in a particularly painful contraction I was going one two three four it was actually much louder than that <laughs> so after uh, the contraction Julie just lovingly patiently looked at me and said I know you're excited but you're screaming in my face <laughs> stop it <laughs> she probably wished that I was struck mute in that very moment now Zechariah. Zechariah, in today's reading, we see what happens almost immediately after Zechariah is able to speak again. <coughs> Excuse me. So Zechariah, in the passage just before this, does break out into songs of praise and thanksgiving. But it is during this time that we actually see what Zechariah has to say. He finally is able to speak, and the very first thing that he does is to praise God. What we read this morning is often referred to as the Benedictus. The Benedictus. It's after the first words of this passage when it's translated into Latin. Blessed be in Latin means Benedictus. It's a popular canticle. It is a beautiful piece of music. And the words, of course, paint a beautiful picture of the goodness of God. Blessed be the Lord our God. That is how Zechariah's song begins. Why? Why should God be blessed? Why did after nine months of not being able to say anything, does Zechariah break out into song and say, Blessed be the Lord our God? It's because Zechariah knows something. He knows that God is about to act. He knows that God is about to do something wonderful to remember his people and to remember that they are going to see something beautiful happen because of who they are in relation to God. God is good, and God is going to remember his promises. God is going to remember that he made an oath to Abraham and the descendants of Abraham that he would be their God, and God would be with them through thick and thin. Zechariah's song brings out a little bit about the character of God, <clears throat> the goodness of God, that God is the kind of God who does not allow things to just go on and go on and go on and deteriorate over time. But God is a kind of God who, who wants to work with us, and God will allow us to fail along the way. But at the end of it all, God is going to step in because God loves us. 
God is going to break in to the world because God desperately wants us to be in a deep and meaningful relationship with him. That is why Zechariah breaks out in praise because he remembers who God is and what God promises that he will do. In this moment, he praises God for all that he is. Now, in verse 76, the canticle, the benedictus, the song of Zechariah continues, and the focus shifts away from God, and it goes towards his son, John. Now, John is about eight days old. He's not very old. But Zechariah has already heard a little bit about what life will have in store for his son. John will go before whoever this Messiah is and prepare the people. He will get them ready. They're trapped in darkness, waiting for God's light. And it's John's role not to bring the light, but to prepare people to be able to see the light. Zechariah sees the work of his son being important, vital, and yet at the same time, he's not really going to be the one that everybody looks to as the most important person, but the one who tees it up for whoever comes next. Zechariah sees his son reaching to the hearts of the people to get them ready because they're in darkness and they've forgotten that they're in darkness. He has to prepare them to be able to see the light when it comes. I want you to think about that for a moment because sometimes we just assume that when something is happening, we will see it, right? When something is about to take place, we're smart enough, we're educated, we can see that something is about to happen. And yet, how many times in, in your life have you been blindsided by something? How many pollsters have been wrong and blindsided by results? How many times have people in the economy read the tea leaves wrong and seen money either evaporate or grow in ways that they did not think it could? We cannot always see the things that are around the corner. And I think that is true about ourselves and who we are and how we live our lives. Sometimes we are blind to the way that we are living. Sometimes we are blind to the ways in which we are out of tune with God. And it takes someone like John to come and speak that difficult truth to us, to remind us that we are not in harmony with God and we need to get back into harmony with God. You know, it starts in these little ways where we, we just sort of inch away and away and away, not thinking we're really that far away from God, and then we look back and the chasm is much larger than we ever expected. Zechariah was a priest. He was in the temple. He was there in the sanctuary of God. He was going to worship God, to meet God in that moment, and yet he was still blindsided by Gabriel standing there. And if I have to admit it, I would be too. But Zechariah, in that moment, was encountered by a messenger from God. And he was given good news, and yet even in that moment, he wasn't ready to receive it. He was doubtful, hesitant, whatever it was that was in his voice when he responded to Gabriel that caused him to be mute for those nine months. We all need preparation in order to meet God. And in a way, that makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense that we need to be prepared to meet God because we know we don't have everything together and there's no real way to get everything together before we meet God. But we do need to be able to know that God is on the way, that God is moving, that God is about to enter into this world. And when God does, maybe we'll be more inclined to notice God. Because God does not typically come into a situation or into the world and say, I'm God, here I am, I'm here to help. Notice Jesus does not do that. He enters into the world and begins to prepare, to teach, to heal, 
In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, he tells people, don't tell them that I'm the Messiah. The idea here is that God moves in these small, often uh, missed moments in our lives, in these people in our lives that come into our lives and speak something that is meant to help us grow. And if we cannot, if we cannot take that as God preparing us to meet with Him, to be His own people, then we will sometimes miss the moment that God arrives. You know, we're meant to be shocked by what happens in this text. But because we read this text over and over, every three years or so, we sometimes miss it. But think about all the people that were there watching Zechariah to go from not speaking anything for nine months to breaking into praise. It's a miraculous moment. The whole reason that Zechariah is silent for nine months is because he doubted. And then yet, after he is able to find words, he goes right to praise. Think about the transition, the transformation that happens to go from one place to another. Again, that's miraculous. The change that happens in Zechariah's heart allows him to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to then praise God in that moment. That transition, that transformation is all about what his son, John the Baptist, will do for us. Not many people will be mute for nine months to get that sort of preparation. But that change of heart, that hardness of heart that is broken open into a heart of praise, that transition that happens for Zechariah happens whenever John meets someone and proclaims to them the forgiveness of sins that God is going to show up and the light will break into the world. John's role eventually is to go out into the wilderness and baptize people. This was not an offer of salvation. John could not offer that. It was an act of repentance. They would go out into the water and they would say that they were sorry to God and they would go down in the water and come up ready to live a new life. Ready to look for God. Ready to meet God in their heart and in the world. That kind of transformation is exactly what John has in his job description. To offer that sort of transformation to other people. So that when Jesus arrives on the scene, there would be people ready to be able to acknowledge who he is and what he could do for them. John the Baptist is coming to each of us today and telling us that we need to get ready to meet God. Each of us has got to prepare our hearts and prepare our minds to meet Christ. I mean, think about it. We are in the midst of the Advent season. Christmas is around the corner. We're having Christmas parties this Sunday and next Sunday for a lot of our Sunday school classes. We're preparing our homes, decorating our trees. And yet, could it be that Christmas Day comes and we have missed the moment to greet Jesus for who He is? Jesus brings more than just grace. He brings more than just divine presence to us. In the season of Advent, we celebrate hope, joy, love, and peace as we go around the Advent wreath. John's role is to remind us that God brings us a total transformation, not only of our lives and our hearts, but our world as well. When we celebrate Jesus being born into the world, we're celebrating a radical transformation of everything. The whole world can and will be transformed to be more in line with God and His kingdom. That's what we celebrate. That God will be able to take this world and make it look even more like heaven year after year after year. That can be difficult when a people live in darkness. But the more that people are awakened to the light that Jesus brings, 
the more that that can be possible. The more that people's hearts are prepared to meet God in person, the more that all of what God promises becomes possible. For us, it's, it's time for us to have our hearts touched and transformed by God. It's time for us to open up our lives to the inbreaking of the light. Dawn is coming. It will come as surely as it came this morning after those terrible winds and rains from last night. As Jesus comes again into our world, into our hearts, and into this church, we invite you to open up your lives and open up your heart that you might allow God to truly transform you from the inside out. But what does that look like? For Zechariah, we already saw. He went from being doubtful and hesitant to becoming a person of great praise. If your heart is a little grinchy right now, if it's a little bit on the complaining side of things, you're going in the wrong direction. If your relationships are falling apart, if you're having to lie to others to to keep all of the things going on in your life going, you're going in the wrong direction. Friends, these are the kind of things where Jesus can come in and heal all of our issues and all of our relationships. I wish I could tell you it was going to be easy, but I can't do that because I'd be lying to you. John the Baptist does not say to people that, you know, the change that's coming is going to be easy. No, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be good because who is coming after me will baptize you by the Holy Spirit. I think we all understand that if we can open ourselves up, if we can be truthful about our predicament, who we are and how our lives are not the way we wish they would be, we know the answer is Jesus. We just have to open up our lives and our hearts and to be prepared for that is to allow God to work through us in music, in sermons, through friends, through the reading of Scripture, whatever it may be. God wants and desires to work to prepare you to meet Jesus. May God do that wonderful work in your heart this Advent season. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we thank you for this new light, this breaking in of the dawn that your Son, Jesus, will come into our lives and provide light and hope and grace that will transform everything from the inside out. We know, O oh God, that it's time for our hearts to change. We know it's time for our hearts to be opened up. We know that we need you more than anything else. God, we ask that you would transform us to help repair what is wrong and to guide us step by step in your direction. Bless us as we change and bless us as we seek the light and life of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen.